this morning. If you open your Bibles to Acts, the, the 16th chapter, we're in our 14th lesson in our study of Acts, and we're on the second missionary journey. We have noticed last week we spent some time dealing with Lydia's household to show that household doesn't mean infant baptism, where they were baptized, and we dealt with that to show from Scripture that indeed they could be household servants, and if they were children, they had to be able to believe, and so they, before they could be baptized, the little infants cannot do that. Catholic Church teaches the fact that, well, my parents are having me baptized, and they're promising to raise me up as a, as a Christian Catholic, Catholic-Christian. And, but we don't see that in the Bible, in the New Testament. But a lot of times people see that their household, so that means babies. That's a, a jump that the Bible doesn't take us. Everyone, every, the four times we see household baptisms taking place, they, were, they had to hear the word, they had to believe it, they, had, they spoke in tongues. Now I know little infants speak in tongues to me, but that's not the tongues we're talking about. And uh, those, uh, it just eliminates the infant part and then realize they had household slaves. Lydia, the one we're looking about, she was a, a businesswoman and she had a home and she had servants. Uh, there's no reason to not doubt that. Maids and that sort of thing to, uh, with her and her ability to support them. So we come now to where the jailer realizes uh, what he's heard to be bab baptized and he's done that and he showed his faith in baptism. We connected all that together. And now we look at the question number 17, that all of a sudden, after the earthquake, and maybe it was just a <clears throat> earthquake on the prison, not the whole area. So it could be that the magistrates, those who were the chief rulers of that area, with their lictors, which were the surgeons, uh, they were the, the men that carried the rods, and that, in verse 22, uh, cut up the back of Paul and Silas, that they're involved in uh, dealing with something that they, the magistrates told the surgeons, you let them out, let them go free. And does Paul just go free without uh, uh, having a problem with them? That's what we'll see. And notice in, in our question is, why did Paul, Paul want the magistrates to release him? So he, he does say, you're not gonna send me out privately. Uh, at, at this time, and, the, and what was the reason for that? In verses 37 through 40, as we come to the end of chapter 16. Why did Paul want the magistrates to release him? He wanted to tell them what they had done to him. And, and, those, and those were the leaders. They got their surgeons, they got their sergeants, we have that, uh, to go release them. And it's, I want the magistrates. Because look at verse, tw back up to verse 20. And when they brought them unto the magistrates, they said, these men being Jews, and that's an interesting thing. That's how maybe they were able to go about and, and abuse them. <laughs> Do exceedingly trouble our city and set forth customs which is not lawful for us to receive or to observe, we being the Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates rent their garments off them and commanded to be to beat them with rods. There comes the next guys, the lictors, some translations have. The rod carriers, they would, they would go where, where the magistrates are and, and they would bring forth the rod in order to examine the people and examine the prisoners and, and I guess beat the truth out of them is what was taking place. So he wants the magistrates. They're the ones they ripped their clothes off. They commanded you, lictors, to beat us with rods. And that's, that's what the word means, rod carriers. That's what they, they did. We want them to release us. Now, that question is, why can Paul, why do it, would Paul say that? He's a Roman. No, you're a Jew. I'm a Roman Jew. And I, therefore, am a citizen and the law had been, Livy says, the law had been uh, 360 B.C. <laughs> that you do not, you do not, you know, kind of bring rods or stripes upon a Roman citizen. It's been in play for a long time. And so when they heard, <laughs> these are Roman citizens, that bothered them. That bothered them. And so 
they came and besought them. And when they had brought them out, they asked them to go out of the city. And they went out of prison and entered in the house of Lydia. So magistrates have to come out. We want them to come out and realize that we indeed were Roman citizens. We, we, we are Romans and they've cast us into prison. Do they not cast us out privately? You didn't examine us to put in prison. It was a riot. And therefore, you, you did that to kind of calm things down. But we didn't get our due process. You didn't follow the law that's been in place for 400 years and in, a, in the Roman society. Now, it's interesting that Paul does that here after he's beaten. But we'll see at the end of the book of Acts when he's in Jerusalem, he, before he's beaten, he lets them know that he is a, a, a Roman citizen. And therefore, uh, they have no right to examine him that way, and they didn't. Yes, David? Yeah, I, I agree with you. There, there's the appeal to uh, the law that we live under, even when the authorities may say, you, uh, you've got to do this and you can't do that. And that's, that's the corollary to what Paul says, that, that we're going to obey the law. Romans 13, we're going to say he's God's minister in order to uh, bring forth order and to uh, convict the guilty and to... Uh, kind of keep down the, that which is wrong and uphold that which is right. We see in Romans 13, but what happens when the authorities, when the government does things contrary to, in this case, Roman law that they were under, or in our case, we have a constitution that says, you don't fool with churches uh, meeting. <laughs> That's not the area you do. And what did the law do? Shut down churches. Could not we appeal to the law of, of God and realize that it's also the law that we, we meet together and that we also have a law in our land that you're not to infringe upon our exercise of our religious rights. We've got that as citizens. And I think in a proper way, maybe in prison, we'll get that out. But there is the appeal and we have scripture, as David said, we have scripture of appealing to the laws of the land in order to have justice in order to do what is right to us as, as citizens. And sometimes we, we, we all make Romans 13, you've got to obey the law then, we're going to shut it down. And uh, I'm thankful that we didn't, and we lived in a community that the police were out here, and, uh, but they did never shut us down. And I'm thankful to them, I'm thankful to God, I'm thankful for his providence, but I'm thankful for elders who say, we're going to do what God says do. And that doesn't mean people that were sick or they were on the verge of maybe getting sick in very dis difficult times. They, they didn't have to come. And, uh, but we had a right to meet. And that, I think that keeps us strong when we're able to do that. So Paul just doesn't leave, leave town and get the problem out of the way. He lets them know that. And then the leaders had to come and send him out of town. So where does he go? He goes to Lydia's house. And, uh, and he saw the brethren, and they comforted them, and then they depart. And therefore, we see them making uh, another move on this second journey. Any questions on, on uh, Acts 16 or any comments you'd like to make? All right. Before we do that, we're going to take our test. And I asked you to uh, close your books, or you don't have to close your books, but it's, it's not an open book test. It's you just think about it. And so I, we, I want us to be able to trace this part of the second journey and you take me through it, okay? You see, the, you see the map, you see a lot of towns there. Where are we at this time? The, the journey has started in Antioch of, of Syria, oh, excuse me, the Antioch of Syria. Let's see, where am I? 
Well, I guess it's not going to. So <laughs> Antioch of Syria, it's on the, the middle right hand corner, right hand part of the, that you see where Antioch is. So let's take me, take me through. They go through the Bible says Cilicia. So what town is there in Cilicia? Tarsus probably. So we're, we're taking a northwest move. And then we go to the region of Phrygia and Galatia. We're going to in between there in Phrygia and, and Galatia. And then where do we go from there? We're heading toward Mysia. And we're not allowed to go into the southern part, into, southern, uh, into Asia. Nor were they allowed to go into Bithynia. Do you see Bithynia at the top? Couldn't go south, couldn't go north, but you're heading toward uh, Mysia, and then you go down to where? Well, no, you go across there. Now, if you're going down, because Ebola, Ebola, <laughs> the, you're getting closer to the sea, <laughs> and you're getting lower, just like going up to Jerusalem, you do that in Jericho, which is north of Jerusalem. So you, you have that. Luke is very precise. He knows his geography. And we just need to get in with him and realize, I see why he's going down to Troas. And so from Troas, what happens in Troas? The division. It's the Macedonian call where a man stands and says, come over and help us. And then they understood this is the goal to preach the gospel. So they leave from Troas and they go straight to what island? Samothrace. Straight over there. From Samothrace, they don't took the next day. They end up in what town? And that's, uh, looking at that red dash cross under Thrace, you go to what town? Yeah. Neapolis. And from Neapolis, they went to where? Philippi. You got it. You got it. And that's, that, of course, that's half of our journey. And we're getting ready to go into Thessalonica now. And so you see where... Uh, that is, and the two towns, Amph Amph Amphibolis and, and uh, Apollonia, in between there, you go into Thessalonica. So those are real places. And then this is kind of the, the picture of, of the map that we're, we're looking at. So we began to see his journey. And we're picking up. Notice we were Antioch, the Tarsus. We go through between Galatia and Phrygia. So maybe they went to Lyst Lystra and Iconium. And Derby, those are, well, I didn't mention those, but he was there. Uh, on the way up to Mysia, it's kind of the way the author says, down up to Troas, Samothrace, Neapolis, Philippi, and now we're going into Thessalonica. And so there's, the, there's that journey. We, we did the first journey real well, and we're, I think we're doing the second journey real well. Any, any comments on those places? Kind of a, 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 kind of a good way to go. <laughs> But that's the journey that, that we're on. Now, we get into chapter 17, our lesson 15. Uh, and those, these outlines are available for you online. They're out there in the, uh, the current ones are out there in the foyer as well if you need to pick those up. So what we do, we want to do some identification. This is kind of looking over this next section. And some, uh, maybe you've been in Mars Hill. I know some have here. And so identify that for us. If you don't want to, you don't have to, but let's, let's do that. Where, what, where's Mars Hill? Where is it? Athens, Greece. And it's an outcropping and a, you know, a, white, a white stone. And we begin to say, well, what is that? And so let's see what the, the Bible says here. I don't, my Bible doesn't ever say Mars Hill. Translations, other translations do. But we begin to know uh, exactly, well, what... What was that? And it's the Areopagus where we find that hill. And Eris was a god. And this is the rock of Eris who came down and in Greek mythology was, was put on trial for killing a, another god, a son of a, of a god. And this is where he made his case. And so it's Areopagus. And we'll, we'll talk more about, about that. But there's where it is. And it's located. And... That's Greece outside of there. And so you see, if you can walk up, there's the plaque of Paul's sermon that he gives in Acts 17, the uh, idea of Mars Hill, that he's, uh, that, where he is. And that's just the, the hill of, of the god Eros. And uh, he's, the, he's the Greek god of war. 
So you see it from, a, from the right-hand corner, you see it from an uh, elevated picture there, where that would be a place where you could stand out and talk to a, a pretty good crowd, and people could hear you. And so when he make, does his sermon, that's what he's going to uh, preach, that's where he's going to preach from. And so we get, we get a picture, that's a real live place, and you can go visit it today, and you can see the black. Uh, it's not fairy tale stuff. It's, it's reality, but it's, it's an outcropping of rock that was had had a very important history uh, to it. Who are the Areopagites? They're judges of the Areopagus, <laughs> the idea of the judicial council in Athens, and they're the ones that we see in Acts 17, what verse uh, 34. But certain men clave unto them. I believe among them also is uh, uh, Dionysus, uh, the Aparagite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with him. And so there are going to be ones that are, are there, and they hear the gospel, and they're part of the judges. And while not everybody would listen to them, uh, to Paul, some did. And we'll, we'll pick up on them as well. Who is uh, Titus Justice in our, our study? Acts 18 and verse 7, he says, He departed thence and went into the house of a certain man named Titus Justice, one that worshipped God. What does that tell us as we identify him? One that worshipped God, probably a proselyte, converted to monotheism, serving one God. They worship God. Whose house was joined hard to the synagogue. It was right next to it, connected, real, real close to it, if not connected. And so he's the one that is indeed worshiping, uh, worshiping God, and uh, he was joined to that, the synagogue. All right, we'll see another one, Sosthenes. Verse 17, chapter 18. They all laid hold on Sosthenes. He was the ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him before the judgment seat, and Galileo cared none for these things. He didn't like them, but they did it anyway uh, because of, of him being a ruler of the synagogue. And he, had, he, had, uh, he was given heed to those, those people. So that's, that's what, what took place. So those are ones that we'll come across, especially in the chapter 18. But we begin to see that there are real places. There are people at that time in real life situations. They live next door to the synagogue and, all, and this idea of bringing persecution upon those who would indeed listen to Paul and they would be Jews, they would be proselytes, and they would suffer for the cause. And we don't think about their names much. Sosthenes, he didn't deserve that, but that's what happened. We'll, we'll pick up more details as, as we go. All right, question number one in this, this section. What did Paul reason about from the scriptures? with the Thessalonians and the Bereans. We're going to see both of them uh, side by side, and, and they're compared to each other, they're contrasted with each other by, by Luke as well. So verse 17, let's get our maps right. And when they had passed through Amphibolus and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. And what was there? There was a synagogue. There was enough Jewish population of males to have a synagogue. And so he went there as his custom was and went unto them, and for three Sabbath days. So that means he was there at least how long? Okay. I have three Sabbath days. I'm going to be there, you know, probably maybe three weeks. Yeah. Is there every seventh day? Every Sabbath? Uh, and so, well, he's only there for three weeks. He may have been there a little longer than that. But we know it's a short time. And that helps us. Because when we read Thessalonians, he has to keep reminding them how much he cares for them. They were new converts. And he had to abruptly leave. And we just know from a time frame here that for three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. Now, whether he spent more time there, we know at least that much time doing it. So what did he reason from? From the scriptures. Not from the wisdom of the Greeks, not Plato and Socrates. He reasoned from the scriptures. And what does that tell you? What are the, what are the scriptures? 
2 Thessalonians hadn't been written yet. Revelation probably hadn't been written yet. The whole law, the prophets, the law of Moses. Because what did it do? It pointed toward the coming of Jesus. And what does Jesus say? I, I came to fulfill the law. Not to disrespect it. He obeyed every bit of it and never sinned against it. He's the only one. But he came to fulfill it. It wasn't going to be that law which would take away our sins. And we, we, we've been seeing that in, when we look at the book of Hebrews. So he reasoned from the scriptures, opening and driving it home, alleging that it behooved the Christ to suffer, to rise again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom said he, I proclaim unto you, is the Christ. That didn't take a lot, that didn't take long to read that. But how encompassing is that? Here's the scriptures, and I'm alleging, that's Old Testament scripture is pretty thick. <laughs> Had a lot of scrolls with it. But it pointed toward that the Messiah would be coming. There's your prophets. That the Messiah, the anointed one would be coming. He would suffer. Yeah, the Messiah, the anointed one, would suffer and, and die. That's the idea of, of suffering because he's going to, uh, to die. And he would do what? Which is miraculous. Rise from the dead. Jesus didn't, didn't, didn't die uh, permanently. And you say, well, he, he, was, he, he was snatched out of the jaws of death. Well, Jesus really wasn't just being chewed. He was in the stomach. <laughs> he was deep. He, he died. And then he was raised. Death did not have control over him. He wasn't just chewing and got spit out by the devil. He was completely devoured. He's dead. And he said, and this Jesus said he, I proclaim unto you. So he's proclaiming Christ, proclaiming Christ crucified. He's resurrected from the dead. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15? That's the gospel. He's preaching the gospel. The power of God to salvation. He said that is indeed the Christ. This Jesus who's died and raised again, he is the Christ. And what do we say when we make that good confession before we're baptized? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. That was Peter's confession. There was a sense of what the, the, the eunuch said. That is the, that's the stone in which Jesus... One person at a time on which Jesus builds his church on. And it is a public confession of one's belief. To let it be known, this is not just a private thing. There is indeed that part of it that is uh, publicly done among many witnesses. And we see that's how we're added to the church. We become a, a stone set into Jesus' spiritual church, the spiritual kingdom as well. And so... There's, there's what he's reasoning about. It wasn't man's philosophy, and yet he's dealing with Jews. And what are Jews supposed to be having respect for? The law of Moses. He doesn't preach that way in Athens. He doesn't appeal to the law of Moses. He preaches Jesus and his death, you know, death and resurrection. But he approaches that from the standpoint of where the Athens are. They're pagans. They don't care about the Bible. They don't care about the scriptures. That doesn't have an impact upon them. They don't know a lot about the scriptures. And the Jews would be different. That was their book. That was the law that they professed to be under. The Pharisees were strict applying that. They just, they just had loopholes. <laughs> but they, and they, the Sadducee didn't believe in resurrection. So that was contrary to the, the teaching here. So we begin to, to see that, yes, there's one gospel, but we can use our wisdom of how we approach people. Where are people coming from? Why, why quote the, the scriptures and then, uh, well, okay, we don't believe it. Where do you have to start with our modern generation? You've got young people that don't even know the Bible. They've never been exposed to it. And... They're, they have a problem with uh, absolute truth. It's all relative. Well, that's anything. You talk about Jesus, I'll talk to you about uh, the, the Buddhist gods, and uh, it, it's very difficult. But we have to come to, to them and realize that, indeed, we may have to start where they have their confidence in. 
and it, and it may not have confidence in a lot of things. You just may have to just say, you know, Jesus gives us hope and you, you don't have any. And maybe start there. And so there's different places you can start in the New Testament and the Bible to teach people. And that the more experience you have, you need to be using that, that, that experience. It's amazing to me that the book of Jude, and the reason I'm concentrating on that, because that's the last book of our commentary. When I get through Jude, it's over. Okay, we have done the New Testament. But one of the things about that short epistle is the fact of how much history is being set forth, assuming that everybody knew it. Recording of ancient history. And Jude is writing to people, said, here's, here's Balaam, here's, here's all these things that, that, that happened. And they, it was part of their, their history. And they didn't have a lot of writing being done. There was writing. But it's just amazing to me that indeed all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years that I'm going to appeal to them, I'm writing them by inspiration. And God says, here's this event, that event, that event, that event, and this means this. What events? What's happening in our culture today? What are people trying to do? They're trying to eliminate our history. How do they do that? Let's burn down those statues. That had an important place. One time it doesn't anymore. Not with us. Lithuania, when the communists took over that, they killed a lot of your young men. <laughs> That's why they don't have a lot of men, uh, because they've, they've been taken over and back and forth in wars. But they burned their books. You're not able to speak in that language. Therefore, they hate the Russians. And they still have their language. And you honored them by not coming over and speaking Russian to them. You honored them by speaking Lithuanian to them. And to realize that, indeed, the, the Muslims have tried to eliminate the history and the places they've conquered. That's the way men do things. And it's amazing. You do a lot of that, and you realize there's a people grow up. They don't know about that history. There are a lot of people today that weren't here 9-11. They don't know about that. Why don't we just take that out of our history? Just forget about that. We'll forget a lot of lessons, a lot of things that happened. So every generation, the history needs to be set forth, but it also challenges us where are we going to, uh, to, to how are we going to approach them. I've seen that in my years of preaching that I think, well, there, there's an up-to-date illustration, and then I look at the audience, they didn't get it because I'm too old, I'm out of date. <laughs> of course, you can be out of date in a week uh, doing that kind of stuff. But he said, well, I, everybody knew that. I've, I pre I've, pre I've used the illustration of dominoes. I remember preaching, of, of, well, we'll get together and play dominoes. And I had people there from Georgia, they don't know what dominoes is. I said, everybody knows about dominoes. That's Texas. So you have to be, know your audience, know where you're coming from in order to make an impact. Because they didn't, they didn't know about dominoes. <laughs> Uh, they didn't know about, you know, go to the boneyard. <laughs> Big deal. What do, you, what do you mean by that? David? Although he was an inspired man, he was a secular something on a set something that's Those who do not remember Yeah, that's over and over again. Yeah. Okay. Scripture. And that's, that's where we need to come from, but they need to have a foundation for that. And Paul knew that the, the Thessalonians uh, did that. And so he, he begins with them. Now, we compare them, Thessalonians, we haven't talked about the response yet, but we're going to see what the Bereans. And so in verse 10, the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas. Got, got a problem going. We've got to immediately get them out of town. And they did it by night and unto Berea. Who, when they were come, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, verse 11, these were more noble, more honorable than those in Thessalonica, we're, we're studying at the moment, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, examining the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. I love these people, don't you? Eliminate a lot of my problems. Because they had a standard of absolute truth. They did weigh that standard against what Paul's preaching. What Paul and Silas have been, been preaching. And what kind of mind did they have? 
Readiness. It doesn't mean they were just believing everything. So if that's the truth, I'm ready. I'm ready to obey it. I'm ready to submit to it. Does it meet the standard <laughs> that is done? And for years, we say, well, has the Bible? That's the way, it, that's way we're going to do it. And that is right. I just want to know the truth. And here's the standard. Paul says in the Thessalonians, prove all things and hold that, hold fast to that which is good, that which is good in character and beneficial in effect. And that's wonderful. That's not our world today. We don't believe there's absolute truth. We don't automatically go to the scriptures. We don't care enough about examining to find truth because if I find it, it may not be the real truth that I want. And we're sure not going to spend a, every day on it till we solve it. We don't have that going. So what do we do? Throw up our hands and quit? No. We're going to find a way to have to approach them. A lot of times it'll be about their feelings. A lot of times it's going to be uh, about their, their lack of hope. But what's, where, what, do you have, what do you have in your life is certain? Death and taxes. Okay, we can start there. We're going to die. Go pay our taxes. And find something that they're relying on to realize, is that, is that okay with you? And so let's just talk about people who are atheists. Humanism is the only hope for them. That's what humans are. That's why we've got to change everybody and get on line with our, with our agenda in life. Because uh, that's, Lord, uh, man's going to have the answer for that. And we realize we can just show example after example after example. That's not what you hold on to. It's not something that is there. And then you have the, you have the absolute statements of Jesus and so forth. But there again is a contrast. But if they don't, don't receive that, there's people in Thessalonica didn't receive it. But here was those that, and it just shows you if, you, if you have that type of a hearer, you got the truth. And wonder if I mess up and I, well, I made a mistake. Then I, I want to know the truth. And they can show me the scriptures. I'm ready to receive what that is, and I will grow from that and thank you. Now, why aren't you a Christian? And to me, I, said, I wish it was that way. And, but it's, it's, it's not that way right now. But the Bereans had that. And what a wonderful thing. Just show me from the scriptures. And they could bring the scriptures up. There's a Messiah coming. He is the son of God that Jesus has anointed. He's prophet, he's priest, and he's king. And you spend Isaiah 53 and you can talk about this is what the gospel is. He's come. Jesus is the Christ. And the evidence will be there before them. But how does God describe people who are more noble than others. How do you receive the word? How do you receive the word? My word is truth. And that's the, the point that made. Any, any comments? Okay, okay. Question number three. What charge did the Jews in Thessalonica accuse Paul and his companions? What, what did they, they, they accuse him? Uh, when you when you boil down to what they said, well, that's what they charged them charged them with. But in connection with that, that is true. Uh, verse uh, seventeen and, and six. He says, and when they found them not, they dragged Jason and certain brethren before the rulers of the city, crying, they have turned the world upside down and are come hither also. They turned the world upside down. They're causing trouble. Yes, and they'll have another king and it's not Caesar. Well, that's a lie. Jesus didn't come to be, a, be in competition with Caesar. He did come to be king. But it's a different type of king. So, thank you. The, the point that they're trying to get him on it's indeed something that needs to be explained and would not be worthy of them trying to get, kill him. But the point is they turned the world upside down. And that can be good and that can be bad. But why is it used here? It's disrupting our Roman, it's disrupting our Roman culture and all the things we do. We've we got many gods and, and we honor Caesar and so forth. And uh, they, 
that was enough to drag Jason and certain brethren because Jason and certain brethren were welcoming those guys. They were accepting them. And they would have liked to have gotten Paul and Silas. They couldn't get them, so they get Jason. Said, these, these are the ones. They, before the rulers of the city. And he said, these have turned the world upside down and are come hither also. And Jason hath received these and act contrary to the decrees of Caesar. Derek's point saying there is another king, one Jesus. That's true, but it's not the one that should be disrupting the world. It's out of, of saving the world. But again, they're looking at it through the eyes of Rome and the leaders and, and Caesars and, and all of those, those things that are there and the worshiping of many gods in, the, in that culture. Any, any thoughts on that that you might have? All right. Why did Jason and some brethren suffer in Thessalonica? Bring, I brought them in a little early on that. Well, why did they, they do that? There's the decrees of Caesar that Jesus was another king, but they had, they had turned the world upside down, and they had received them. And if you receive one, then you're, you're guilty of what they, they stand for. I remember President Bush saying that. Anybody's going to give them cover, knock down these walls, uh, we're, they're gonna, we're going to come after them too. And I remember that. And I said, hmm, that would be a good illustration for fellowship. You give cover to a false teacher, then you're guilty of, of, of receiving them. And 2 John 9 says that. That didn't go over too well with people when I preached that at, at places. And because, no, you each, you each do their thing, I do their thing, we still have fellowship with one another. If I receive the one who doesn't bring the teaching, I am a partaker of that man's evil works. That's not philosophy. That's not some scholar. That's, that's God speaking to the Holy Spirit. And what does that do? It says, well, I didn't teach that doctrine. Well, you received the one who did. That would isolate false teaching. I'm afraid some of us have connected it. Said, well, let it go. Everybody does their own thing. And that's not the way the New Testament is founded on, on principles that way. And so we have to come back. Is that, is that false teaching or not? You get back to the word. And I want to know what the word is. And that's what we'll do. And he come back to that. That's what was noble about the Bereans. I hope that we'll remain that way as well. Question number five. Who all were persuaded and believed the word of God in Thessalonica and Berea? Who all, who all did that? Let's look at verse four. Some of them were persuaded and consorted with Paul and Silas of the devout Greeks. There's your proselytes, devout Greeks, and a great multitude, and the leading women, the chief women, not a few. You got women, proselyte, maybe men, uh, a great multitude. The gospel is, is for all. Now, that was in Thessalonica. We come down to verse 12. Many of them therefore believed also of the Greeks, Women of honorable estate and of men, not a few. We see polls for our president. He's got the women vote. He's got the men vote. He's got the young people's vote. And therefore, oh, I've got to appeal to this, got to appeal to that. Who does Jesus appeal to? Everybody. He came to save the world of sin. Men, women, proselytes going to have been converted to the Jewish religion. You need to hear the gospel. And so we have, a, we have a people to reach. And everyone has a soul that becomes responsible for their soul. We have a lot of people to try to reach. And that's, that, that just broadens the field. I remember I used to sell things and I had to, well, they don't buy this, they don't buy that. And I had to realize I got to make them want to buy it. That's what you do as a salesman. But you begin to realize I, I'm limited here. You're not limited with people. The only limitation is when they don't want it. And you, you just move on to some, some other, other person. You, you try, but you're trying to spread that. And that's how we, we spend, our, and, and spend our time and, and do that wisely. Any other thoughts along that line? Okay, we'll, we'll stop there. We'll pick up, Lord willing, a true or false question. That'll be easy next week, Lord willing. And thank you for those of you visiting being here. And we will hopefully have another time in our study.